What does it mean that God is sovereign? Welcome to the Gospel Message radio program. My name is Wes Hepner, and today we have a guest speaker. His name is Dieter Pinner from Manitoba, Canada, and he wants to bring us this short message on God's sovereignty, that God knows all, God sees all, God is all-powerful, and God is in control. I think it's a really great message for the time we're living in today. But before we go into that message, let's take time to pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to share your word. We thank you that you truly are sovereign. We thank you for Dieter and his willingness to share your word. And I pray for each listener that you would bless them, that you would encourage them, and that you would bring them to a place where they can put their total trust in you. Thank you, Jesus, again for this time that we have on this radio program. I pray that your Holy Spirit will lead and guide. And I pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Here is Dieter Penner. The God of Israel is sovereign, even over the most powerful nations. This is what God's chosen nation, Israel, needed to hear, because in the year 605 before Christ, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, who was one of the most powerful pagan kings, conquered Jerusalem and took captives back to Babylon. Babylon was located 50 miles south of present-day Baghdad in Iraq. Some of God's chosen people now lived in exile, possibly facing a lifetime of service in a pagan kingdom, and surely this would have caused them to ask, what would happen now? Was the God whom the Babylonians worshipped more powerful than the God of Israel? Would Israel forever be in Babylonian captivity? The book of Daniel answers these questions. It's one of 66 books in the Bible which tells us the story of God and His marvelous salvation. Many Bible readers love the first half of the book for its dramatic stories about Daniel and his friends, while others find the second half of the book fascinating for its detailed prophecies about future empires and kingdoms. Since this book is full of heroic stories of faith and contains some of the Bible's most amazing prophecies, We are prone to make two interpretive errors and therefore miss Daniel's main message. In the first half of the book, we're prone to make Daniel the hero of the story and miss the point that God is in fact the hero of the story. It is God who brings Daniel into favor of government officials and gives him surpassing knowledge in chapter 1. God is the one who gives and interprets dreams in chapter 2. God saves Jewish men from the fiery furnace in chapter 3. Furthermore, God humbles arrogant human kings in chapter 4 and 5. He rescues Daniel from the lion's den in chapter 6. And ultimately, God will return Israel to their land, even though they have forsaken the covenant. Yes, Daniel displayed great faith in hostile surroundings, But let us not forget the object of his faith was God, and without God, Daniel could do nothing. In the second half of the book, we can become preoccupied with prophecies about end times and become so obsessed with end time prophecy that we miss the prophet's main message, which is God is on the throne and in complete control of history, even though it looks like powerful men are in control. The overarching theme of Daniel is the kingdom of God. Daniel will show us that God is the king of this kingdom and give us insight into how citizens of God's kingdom should live in a hostile heathen society as they trust God and wait for God's kingdom to one day fill the entire earth. Daniel does this by contrasting the temporary kingdoms of man versus the eternal kingdom of God. This kingdom concept is foreign to a lot of us living in a 21st century Western democracy. We do not fully understand what it means to be a king, to have such authority vested in an individual. But Daniel lived during a time when kings had supreme authority. In chapter 5 of Daniel, verse 18 to 19, he describes the authority and majesty of King Nebuchadnezzar like this. O king, the Most High God gave Nebuchadnezzar, your father, a kingdom and majesty, glory and honor. 
And because of the majesty that he gave him, all peoples, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him. Whomever he wished, he executed. Whomever he wished, he kept alive. Whomever he wished, he set up. And whomever he wished, he put down. We can hardly imagine such authority vested in one single individual. To execute whomever he wished, to set up whomever he wishes, and to put down whomever he wishes. Notice our text says, All peoples, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him. You see, Daniel experienced firsthand what it means to be subject to a king of such authority. Because we learn in Daniel chapter 1 that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem in the year 605 before Christ and besieged it. As a result, the king of Judah and others, among them Daniel and his friends, were taken captive. Their life was turned upside down. They now lived in captivity and faced a lifetime of service to Gentile kings. When the first verse of Daniel is read in isolation, the reader may get the impression that King Nebuchadnezzar is sovereign and triumphed over Israel because of his military power. In fact, a Near Eastern reader of this verse would have concluded that the God of Israel had lost to the God of Babylon. But thankfully, the narrator gives a key insight in verse 2 and informs us that the Lord, the Lord God, gave the king of Judah into the hands of the king of Babylon. What looked like a victory for Nebuchadnezzar was actually a victory for the Lord God of Israel. Because at this time, the Lord had raised up Babylon to defeat Judah. Later, he would raise up the Medes and Persians to attack and conquer Babylon. God was and is in control of history, even when it looks like powerful men are in control. This is the key to the book of Daniel. It's repeated three times in chapter 4, verse 17, 25, and 32. In order that the living may know that the Most High rules in the kingdoms of men and gives it to whomever he chooses. It's ironic that this key utterance comes to us through the lips of King Nebuchadnezzar, the one who'd been given such majesty that all peoples, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him. God had previously warned Nebuchadnezzar through a dream, which Daniel interpreted, to humble and repent of his pride. But Nebuchadnezzar was unwilling to humble himself, and therefore God predicted how God himself would humble Nebuchadnezzar like an animal. And after waiting for 12 months, God fulfilled this prediction. Daniel chapter 4 is written in biographical form by Nebuchadnezzar himself. And in verse 3, he informs us of the lesson he learned, namely, that the God of Israel is sovereign. And then in the rest of the chapter, he goes on to describe how he learned this lesson. Nebuchadnezzar was flexing his royal muscles before God and said, Is this not great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling, by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty, while the world was still in the king's mouth? A voice fell from heaven, King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken, the kingdom has departed from you, and they shall drive you from men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make you eat grass like oxen, and seven times shall pass over you. Verse 32, until you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men, and gives it to whomever he chooses. That very hour, the word was fulfilled concerning Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from men and ate grass like oxen. His body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair had grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. The Bible goes on to describe how the king of Babylon then submitted himself to the Most High, the sovereign God of Israel, and acknowledged that God's dominion is an everlasting dominion and that God's kingdom is from generation to generation. Why does God humble arrogant human kings? Because He alone is sovereign. Now what do we mean when we say God is sovereign? Webster's defines sovereignty like this. It means to be above or superior to all others. It means to be chief, greatest, or supreme. Supreme in power, 
rank and authority. A person who possesses sovereign authority or power, specifically a monarch or ruler. So when we say God is sovereign, we mean that he is the most high. He is the highest in rank. There is no one above him. He is the king, the one who reigns over a kingdom. God rules over the entire universe. He exercises total control and authority. He does according to his will and no one can thwart his plans according to Job 42 verse 2. He is the Almighty, all-powerful. No one can defeat his power. God sets up kingdoms and overthrows empires. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is God. He has ultimate authority. In short, when we say God is sovereign, it means he has absolute rule. He is in control of everything. We struggle to understand this concept because we've never lived under a sovereign, a monarch, a king with absolute rule and authority. But the book of Daniel show us that the most powerful kings of this earth are no match for God. Every earthly king or person in authority is subject to a higher king. Daniel was not intimidated by powerful men. He did not give in to pressures and temptations from pagan kingdoms. Daniel did not defile himself by eating animals that God had considered unclean at this time, but remained faithful to God in chapter 1. Even while Daniel was serving the most powerful king and his fellow government officials were scheming up a plan to make his spiritual disciplines look like a threat to state security in chapter 6, Daniel remained faithful to his God. What was the source of Daniel's courage in such difficult circumstances? Daniel's courage came from his belief in a sovereign God. He trusted the God of Israel. Daniel knew that even though it looked like the most powerful pagan king was ruling, God was overruling. In closing, how can we apply God's sovereignty to our own lives? Firstly, we believe and trust that all comes into our life is either allowed or decreed by a God who will use it for our benefit. Oswald Chambers turned God's sovereignty into a foundational principle and said, absolutely refuse to worry. God may be doing things you do not understand, but he will use it for your good. The Bible says in Romans 8:28, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Israel was in captivity. God was disciplining them for their disobedience. God was purifying them from their idol worship. Since then, Israel has been rigidly monotheistic, which means that they believe in one God. God was using pagan kings to discipline Israel, using them, the pagan kings, as his servants. Secondly, we can learn from God sovereignly that we should bow before him because he is the king of the universe. Why do people bow before kings? Because people know that the king has power to take their life. They do not want to offend the king. And that's only a mere human king. We are now talking about the king of kings, the king of the universe. If you are not a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, I urge you to give your life to Jesus Christ and follow him and make him your Lord and Savior. And if you are a believer, we should submit our time, money, relationships, careers, gifts, plans, and our future to him. Philippians 2 verse 9 to 11 says, Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And finally, a word of hope. When it looks like God is not in control, but powerful men who may even be hostile toward God and His people, we can know that God is sovereign. He may allow us to suffer, but remember, the King of this universe has promised to never leave us. And even if we die, He will raise us up, and one day we will be with Him forever. Therefore, we can trust and follow Him. Thank you.